And to understand this banking crisis, we've really got to understand, first of all, what money is. When you go into a bank and you ask for a loan on a house or car or whatever, what did the bank do? I mean, what was the process? And um, again, we don't seem to ask those questions. Oh, well, they, they, they lend us money. Well, okay. Well, where do they get it from? What has happened because the same network of families that I've been exposing all this time have controlled, indeed created the banking system as we know it, have also controlled the politicians that pass legislation about banking laws and finance. Laws have been passed to create something called fractional reserve lending. It sounds a boring title and, and all the rest of it, but we really need to understand what this means. Fractional reserve lending allows banks to lend at least, and it is at least, 10 times what they actually have on deposit. It's called credit. You know, people say, yeah, uh, there's a credit crunch. What does that mean? It means that loans of, in effect, non-existent money are not being made on the scale they were before. But I'll come to that in a second. You uh, go into a bank and you um, put a dollar in a bank, say. That bank can now lend nine, ten times that dollar uh, because the law says you only have to have something like 10% of, of your theoretical money that that bank has on deposit, or the rest you can loan out. So you go into a bank and you borrow $50,000, say. Now, what the bank has done to create that is type into your account $50,000. It's not there. It's called credit, $50,000. From that moment, you start paying interest on $50,000 to that bank that has been created simply by someone at the bank typing $50,000 into your account. Staggering, but true. They've not moved precious metal anywhere. They've not moved real money into your account, but the theoretical figures on a screen money that they create out of thin air. But it gets better or worse. I then... Take $50,000, uh, a check, of that money, and I buy a car. The person I buy the car to takes the $20,000 and he puts it in his bank. Now his bank, Bank B, can lend 10 times on that $20,000, which at Bank A has been created out of thin air. Um, then he signs a check to someone else or uh, buys something else. And then the person they, they buy it from, they put their money in their bank, which is bank C. Say he bought something for $5,000. Bank C can now lend 10 times the $5,000, which has come from that bank uh, being able to lend on the $20,000, which goes back originally to bank A, where the money was created out of nothing. Now, when you follow this round, and some uh, people uh, have done the maths, one loan to one person of fresh air, out of nowhere money, credit, when it's traveled around the banks and gone from person to person, the interest the banking system as a whole gets from uh, that original one fresh air loan is stupid. Stupendous. And every time you go to the bank and you have a loan, you're starting that process again from you, the money that you loan. Now this it has obviously fantastic implications for um, control of society, but uh, it goes further. What is the difference between an economic boom and an economic depression? It's the amount of money and the perceived value of that money in circulation at the time. So this is what the banking system has done over and over and over again. And we're seeing it now in a very extreme way. Stage one, you want to stimulate a boom. So what do you do? You, you make lots of loans, because that's how money comes into circulation. People say, how does money come into circulation? It's governments in it. No, it's banks, private banks making loans. The more credit they give out, the more 
money they put into circulation, the more they have a, what now is a credit crunch, what they're doing is taking money out of circulation. So in stage one, they make lots of loans to people, and the criteria for getting a loan comes down and down and down, so more and more people get them. This puts lots of units of exchange in circulation, and therefore the ability for people to buy things. This means that companies have to make more things to meet demand. So people get more jobs and there's more orders on the books, etc. And people say, hey, we're in a real boom time now. In boom times, because of the confidence that people have, because there, there are lots of orders at their company they work for, their jobs are strong and safe and all the rest of it, I think it is, people tend to get into more debt. So they borrow money for a bigger house, they have a bigger car, they might have two holidays instead of one or whatever, and, and they're doing it overwhelmingly on borrowed money, this fresh air money. What this creates eventually is a, a, an economic uh, boom where lots of people have got themselves in lots of debt during this boom time. Then, at the optimum time to bring about the outcome that they want, the banking system, which basically works as one unit because it's coordinated, you see individual banks, but the system itself works as one unit through these banks. What they then do is they create a situation that justifies them taking money out of circulation. So what they do is they raise the criteria massively, that's what's happened now, uh, of what you need to do to get a loan. So what they're doing is... Um, they're taking money out of circulation. Um, they also um, can call in loans that are already out there. And this combination means that there's not so much money, units of circulation, uh, of um, uh, exchange, in circulation. So people can't buy as many things. So companies don't have to make as many things. So people start losing their jobs. Companies start going bankrupt. And what, what you could symbolize it as is in stage one, the banking system throws the fishing line out. And then at stage two, the depression, the bust, they then reel it in. So all these people have taken out all this debt. Um, and if you don't pay back the debt which is fresh air money, then the bank has the right to take your real wealth, your house, your car, your land, etc. And so as um, people can't pay back uh, their loans because there's not enough money in circulation anymore to do so, um, the banks start getting hold of more and more real wealth, land, resources, houses, all the rest of it, in exchange for fresh air money. And... Uh, then they move to the, the bust um, uh, uh, area, which we're in now, and uh, people uh, are uh, in desperate financial straits. And on the face of it, the ba some of the banks are. But wh what I'm talking about here is the banking system that these, this network of families control. Individual banks can go bust. It doesn't affect the system. The system's still there. You could think of it of, if you own the European Champions Football League, you don't care if Manchester United lose to Barcelona or Barcelona lose to Manchester United. Like, you don't really care about individual banks, whether this one goes uh, under or this one, you know, gets stronger or whatever, because you own the whole game. And it's from that level that all this boom and bust is manipulated. So... Um, the control of money in circulation is the control of society. It's control over whether some people eat, whether some people have their homes or, or don't have their homes. So from that point of control, you can manipulate what we have now experienced. And what did we experience? It came out of the United States. And the reason it was uh, engineered from there is because the United States economy still today, um, when it uh, is affected in some way, it has global implications. So they orchestrated it through there, and they did it like this. 
There was a man uh, who was appointed head of the Federal Reserve in America, the alleged Central Bank of America, and most Americans think it's the Central Bank of the American government. It is not. It is a cartel of private banks, the most important of which is the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. And I've been exposing um, Alan Greenspan this longtime head of the Federal Reserve. He was appointed during the Reagan-Bush administration. He remained head of the Federal Reserve through Father Bush's period, through the two Bushes of, uh, 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 periods of Clinton, and through the uh, virtually the entire two periods of um, uh, boy George Bush, apart from a couple of years. I think it was 2006 he got out, something like that. And so he basically controlled the American economy all the way through this period, and what he did and orchestrated, and this was followed in Britain and other countries too, was a process of removing all the checks and balances of the financial system, which stopped people uh, making ridiculous loans that people wouldn't be able to pay back, and um, basically stopping a greed-motivated, uh, free for all. All those checks and balances were taken away. What they also did was create a system where within the banks people were getting big bonuses for getting people to take out loans like for houses and stuff. So the more loans they uh, acquired and got people to take out, the more bonuses these people got. Now, there came a point through this so-called economic boom through the 1990s and into the, this century where they basically picked off, in terms of mortgages and, and what have you, all the people who had the income and the, the financial capacity to actually pay back the loans. So if they were going to keep getting the bonuses, they had to start looking elsewhere to um, give loans out. And the only place they could go was into the realm of people who actually did not have the financial uh, stability and, and uh, income to pay back the loan. But it didn't matter to them chasing the bonuses because as soon as they signed the, the loan, they got a bonus. They'd sold another loan. And this, of course, was a disaster waiting to happen. And so what happened was uh, eventually, staggeringly, uh, of course, obviously, vast numbers of people started to not pay their, their mortgage, not pay their loans. They couldn't afford it. They never could afford it from the start. And the banks started to get in trouble in terms of cash flow and all the rest of it. And we had this um, crisis which um, manifested towards the end of the Bush administration last year. What... Um, then happened is they got the people who represent the banks that cause the problem to come into government and decide how government was going to react to the problem. So it was like having a, um, uh, a housebreaker um, invited to the police force to decide how they were going to uh, react to this problem of caused by housebreakers. I mean, it was, uh, it was ridiculous. And during the Bush administration, towards the end, they had a man called Henry, also known as Hank Paulson. This man was head of Goldman Sachs until 2006. And Goldman Sachs, under his stewardship, was a major player in creating this collapse. They make him, in 2006, Treasury Secretary in America, and when the collapse comes, which he's massively played a part in, he's now Treasury Secretary, and he decides how the government's going to react. So what does he decide? That the government, in other words, the American taxpayer, is going to throw multi-billions, hundreds of billions of pounds, uh, or dollars in their case, at the banking industry to prop it up from the problems it has itself caused. 
this was going to stabilize the system. They knew it wasn't. And so then comes uh, Barack Obama, who claims to be Mr. Change, but he's Mr. Business as usual, just another front man for the same network of families that controlled Bush. So he comes in, um, right in the middle of this crisis of the banking system and the financial system. What does he do, Mr. Change? He appoints an economic team which is like a who's who of those who were massively responsible for creating the problem. He brings in the president of the New York Federal Reserve uh, Bank, this key bank in the Federal Reserve cartel, which was fundamentally involved in all the deregulation that allowed this free-for-all to happen and the collapse to come. And he takes this man called Timothy Geithner and he makes him Treasury Secretary. He brings in another man, a banker's boy to his fingertips, who's earned massive amounts of money from the banking industry, called Larry Summers, and he makes him one of his key economic uh, uh, advisors and uh, executives. He brings in a guy called Paul Volcker. Paul Volcker was the longtime head of the Federal Reserve before Alan Greenspan. Um, and Larry Summers in 1991 um, wrote uh, or signed a memo when he was um, chief e uh, economist to the World Bank um, advising the World Bank to dump their toxic materials in third world countries and not Western countries because in third world countries the compensation for the death and uh, disease and injury caused by dumping these toxic materials there would be less than in a Western industrialized country. This is one of the key advisors to Barack Obama. And what do they decide, these bankers people who created the problem when they come in, they decide that the Obama administration should not, no, no, we must not throw hundreds of billions of dollars at the banking system, okay? We must throw trillions of dollars at the banking system. And so the American government has hurled trillions of borrowed money which the taxpayers and children and generations yet unborn will be left with the bill for at the very banking system that has um, caused the problem. But this is not incompetence. You see, incompetence and bureaucratic incompetence is one of the great cover stories for a cold, calculated plan. I've talked to you before about the structure that this network of families wants to create to install this global centralized dictatorship. And it is this, a world government that dictates to every country. And the world government would control a world central bank that would um, control all global finance in every country. A world army which would impose the will of the world government. A world currency to replace all cash currencies with one world electronic currency, no cash. And a microchip population connected to a global computer system and the global positioning satellite system. And then under that, the unions, the European Union, American Union, all the rest of it I've talked about. Now, key in that structure, in what we're talking about today, is the World Central Bank. If you um, do not have an enormous global economic uh, crisis that you have to find a solution for, there is no way that you are going to be able to persuade people to completely restructure global finance around a world central bank that would not in, uh, you know, in, in, in theory, but in absolute effect, be a financial dictatorship to every person on the planet. You're not going to persuade people to do that. What do, what do you mean we want a world central bank dictating world finance? We don't need that. Everything's fine. Leave it. So what you do, of course, this is the technique that they use all the time, is you need a massive problem that destroys the status quo, destroys the financial status quo, and then you can then offer the solution, which is, look, this is so bad, 
There's no way we can sort this out. We have a global crisis because of globalization of the financial system now. No one can sort it out individually. We're going to have to find a global solution to this. And they are already talking about the British Prime Minister Gordon Brown, who was Chancellor of the Exchequer through the Blair Premiership from 97 uh, over 10 years, who mirrored in Britain what Greenspan was doing in America, destroying all regulation uh, to allow the free-for-all to happen. He's now Prime Minister. And, and he uh, is talking about the need for a new global architecture of financial governance. Um, and there's uh, newspaper and magazine articles being placed. Well, maybe what we need is a world central bank. It's already being talked about. So the idea is to create this, and, and, or, and has been, to create this crisis and then to make it so bad that people accept the globalized um, solution to it, in effect solution, alleged solution, and so global finance changes and control of it changes in ways that it never would without the crisis. And so what we're looking at now is a three-stage process to bring that about. One has happened, one is happening, the other one is waiting in the wings to happen. Stage one of this engineered collapse is to collapse the economy in a way that people saw that there was a major problem. This is what they did towards the end of the Bush administration. Stage two was to bring in the people who were responsible for engineering the crisis to offer the solutions to the crisis. And those solutions have been, of course, to hurl unbelievable amounts of borrowed money at the problem, at the banks who've caused the problem, etc. The idea of stage two is to empty the, the gun, if you like, to empty the gun barrels in terms of ability to react to the problem of, of the governments. You get them to um, throw so much borrowed money that there comes a point there's no way they can continue to do that. You also make sure, and we're now seeing this blatantly in America, that all that money thrown at the problem has no effect. Um, and we're now seeing in congressional uh, Senate hearings on Capitol Hill, where these financial administrators from the Federal Reserve and, and other government financial agencies are being asked, where has all this money gone? Where has all this vast amount of money gone that's been thrown at the banks? Who's got it? What have they done with it? Where is it? And they're like, uh, well, we haven't done the audit yet. No, you don't know, do you? Well, we, I can't tell you at this moment, no. It's gone into a black hole because it's not meant to have an effect. And what they're doing in America, and some financial experts are exposing this, is they're artificially um, manipulating the figures of the banks to appear, make it appear as if they're... they're, they're, they're their problems are, are, are getting less and they're starting to, you know, make money again. It's all financial uh, um, manipulation to give the impression that things are, are, are turning around when they're not. This is stage three now. And I can't say when this will be. I can say when it will be, but I can't say when it will be in time. But when it will be, will be when they decide that the barrels of the governments in terms of reacting to this crisis are empty and there's no more uh, money or anything else they can do to react and then they're going to crash the world economy on a major scale and how bad will it be it will be as bad as is necessary to get the world to accept a totally restructured global financial system based on a world central bank which will be a dictatorship um, to um, everybody on the planet in terms of finance and financial um, potential and, and opportunity, etc. Now, what they want at the world government, world central bank level is just a mirror of what's happening in the European Union. 
See, in the European Union, they have uh, the bureaucracy dictating from the centre, which is what they'd want to, uh, uh, the world government to be at a world level. But they also have the European Central Bank, which is the, the, the dictator of finance within the European Union. So what will, what will happen when they go to this world level is you'll have the world central bank as the prime dictator and then it will operate down through the European Central Bank and the central bank of, of the other unions uh, that are being created like the African Union and the American Union that they're, they're closing in on. And so you have this financial pyramid of, of, of central banks headed by the World Central Bank, which will control all global finance. And there are many reasons why they've engineered this collapse, but this is a key reason why they've done it. And, um, you know, just watch what unfolds, and uh, we'll see when they first start talking about, we really need a World Central Bank. It might not be too far from now. It's just, it's just um, a case of how bad do we have to make it before we get what we want. And if they have to make it really, really bad, well beyond uh, the 1930s Great Depression, they will do so, because they're ruthless. U cijelom svijetu danas postoji nekakva vrst povjerenja, uzdanja u novog američkog predsjednika, dok toga Amerika naravno ima najveći utjecaj na svjetske financije. Naravno, prema vašim knjigama, cilj je u stvari Ameriku uništiti kao globalnu silu da bi se moglo stvoriti jednu drugu globalnu državu. Vi u samom slučaju baš ne zvučite kao optimist po pitanju povjerenja u novog američkog predsjednika. I've been talking about Barack Obama and writing about Barack Obama for many, many months, well, well before he won the election. And a lot of people criticize me for it. Because I was saying that this man is a total fraud and a total fake because people looked at his um, smile, his switch on smile. Is the camera on? Yes. Oh, wait. You know, it's this switch on smile. It's like Tony Blair, you know. Press the button, get the smile. And what he was saying about change and uh, I stand for the people and yes, we can and, and all the rest of it. Hope, something to believe in. Um, and they took that on face value and that's what people do. That's why they're so easy to manipulate. So what I did, I started looking at his background and he comes out of the most or at least one of the most corrupt political systems on the planet, which is Chicago, Illinois. If you are not deeply, deeply corrupt and uh, have a attitude that you'll do what's necessary to get power, then you do not survive politically in Chicago and Illinois, never mind prosper. This man's star absolutely soared. So you look at his background and his, at his funding and his associates, and they are like a who's who of Chicago villains, including a man called Tony Resco, who's one of his major fundraisers of his uh, for his political career, who is now in jail for fraud. Um, and again, around him are a series of people who you wouldn't trust to tell you the time in a room full of clocks. Um, that again come out of Chicago. There's a man called Rahm Emanuel. This man, you know when Rahm Emanuel's lying because his lips are moving. And, and, and he's now White House Chief of Staff, controlling the Obama administration from the White House. And another man, who's a close associate and works as one unit with um, Rahm Emanuel, is a man called David Axelrod, another figure out of the deeply corrupt Illinois-Chicago system, who was the man that orchestrated Obama's entire election campaign. He is now senior White House advisor to Obama, and he's the man who oversees the writing of everything that he says. And I mean writing because in America now, because Obama's been gone back on so many fundamental things he said he would not do, and gone back on things he said he would do, but in America, very quickly now, a lot of people who supported him are going, hold on a second, what did, what did we uh, uh, let ourselves in for here? And one of the things that they're seeing 
uh, which is a, a blatant confirmation that he's just a front man, just a, a salesman. I call him a used car salesman. He's not there to decide policy, he's there to sell it. Um, and when you watch him speak, in any situation virtually, you will not see him look straight ahead. Just let people watching this program, watch Obama when he's making a speech, even a short announcement often, and you'll see him look right, speaking, then he'll look left while he speaks, and then he'll look right again while he's speaking, and then, and then left. What he's doing is looking at two teleprompter boards, which have the words going down of his speech, which he's reading. He is so welded to these teleprompters and the words that have been written for him, overseen by this guy David Axelrod, that on St. Patrick's Day in 2009, Obama um, uh, attended a St. Patrick's Day uh, reception, which um, the White House had uh, uh, invited people, including the Irish um, Prime Minister. And Obama stood up to make his welcome speech and thanked himself for inviting everybody because the Irish Prime Minister's speech was still on the teleprompter and not, not his own. So he started reading someone else's speech. And he's known in America now more and more as the teleprompter president. And so right down to even what he says in public is written for him. He is just there to um, sell the policies created in the shadows by the same network of people of which Emmanuel and Axel Rod are public faces that of the force that controlled the Bush administration. So I, I've talked to you before about this technique problem reaction solution which is what we're talking about with the credit situation create the problem get the reaction do something fear and then offer the solutions to the problems you've created what they've done now with the last two presidents is have a presidential version of problem reaction solution bush was brought in to front up the creation of the problems overseas wars and and and, and extending the american military and um towards the end this financial crash and then in comes Mr. Smile, Mr. Fake uh, to offer the solutions to the problems that were created through the Bush administration and these solutions are advancing the agenda of that network that controls Obama as much as it controlled Bush and this is why all the things that uh, Obama said during his election campaign about civil rights, about um, not holding people without charge or trial, um, about what he would do financially, and a, a great swathe of things. He's gone back on all of them because what he said he was do, would do was just to get the votes to get elected, and now he's in, he's just following the agenda of the people who put him there. He, he is no more Mr. Change um, than George Bush was. But what they did with Obama, and of course this guy Axelrod orchestrated it, was to have um, the, the most blatant mass mind manipulation uh, campaign that you could ever see. I studied uh, mind control and mind control techniques in great detail over a period of some five years towards the end of the 90s and um, into the 2000-2001. Uh, and I'm watching this Obama campaign unfold against Hillary Clinton and then against John McCain. And all these techniques are being used. And what they did with Obama was this. And this is used in many countries, and it's good to be wise to it. He kept repeating mantra phrases of change. And, of course, behind him, whenever he spoke, there was these people holding, you know, these... Uh, bits of paper and placards, change, change, Obama, change, all going in the subconscious, all mind manipulation. He talked about change, he talked about hope, he talked about something to believe in, and he talked about, yes, we can, yes, we can. At no point did he ever specify what any of that meant. So, instead of people saying, well, hold on a second, this all sounds very nice, but... What do you mean 
Mr. Obama. What do, you, what do you mean by this? What kind of change? What kind of something to believe in? This was, he was never pressed on any of this. It was just the, the mantra. And what this created, by design, it created a situation where Obama became a blank screen on which vast numbers of people projected their version of what change, something to believe in, uh, uh, and hope, etc., meant. So, in effect, they manipulated the mass co uh, consciousness, or lack of it, to make Obama all things to all people. Because they got him to, if, if you thought change um, that you want meant this, you projected that onto him, yes, he stands for the change that I want. So then he came into office, and of course all that's gone out the window. And he's um, now um, introducing, um, and this is the other thing, because of the smile and the, the, I'm the good guy. By the way, what you need to know and all you need to know is, I'm not George Bush, okay? Because mm -hmm. George Bush's popularity was so low. But because of the public perception of George Bush, Obama is being able to get things through that Bush would never have been able to do. David, thank you, as usual. We've been talking a lot about it, at least we, in your case, we're going to talk about the war crimes, as it's done with the credit, and we hope that it won't be able to get to the end. One of the things... Hello and welcome to this videocast and podcast for subscribers to davidike.com. Well, I've been uh, asked by many people to say something about what's become known as Pizzagate. Uh, this has been, of course, all over the web for weeks, and it breaks down in two basic polarities. There's the mainstream media, sits back in amazement, that has trashed the whole thing, and every detail has been dismissed. Every possibility has been dismissed. But that's what you expect, really. Uh, but on the other hand, you've got um, people who are convinced that every detail of the allegations about Pizzagate are true. And you have this, in my view, grotesque situation of gross hypocrisy, whereby um, anyone who questions that every last fact, or even the whole thing in its entirety, uh, called Pizzagate, uh, is to be uh, questioned, is to be um, not accepted on face value, they are um, subjected to the most vile abuse and trolling um, as a result of having a different opinion to those that believe every last word and alleged fact. Now, I've been um, investigating and exposing the global paedophile ring of um, what you might call, um, not really, but it's what it's called, the elite of the world. Uh, and it is a global paedophile ring not rings, in the end, the, the big one I'm talking about, the elite one. Um, there are obviously um, aspects of it in different parts of the world, but in the end, it is part of one uh, global ring. And there's reasons for this. There's reasons for the obsession with paedophilia and child abuse, uh, which I go into in the books and uh, may do a video cast about it um, um, soon. But... Let's focus on uh, Pizzagate and what's going on um, with that and its place in the greater context of this paedophile ring and what, what has been happening to children decade after decade. The reason, let me say first of all, that this abuse ring, which is also connected into the satanic child sacrifice rings, indeed at the top um, or at the inner core, whichever analogy you want, 
the satanic um, sacrifice rings and the um, paedophile uh, elite ring globally are, are actually aspects of the same thing. And the reason it's not come out is because both victims of it who've survived, many don't, and those who are seeking to expose it have been subjected to ridicule, abuse, dismissal, and um, all that goes with it. I mean, I'm a personification of that very uh, response because of what uh, abuse I've had over the years, uh, putting this information out. And it really is, like I say, hypocrisy and self-delusion on a mega shocking scale that those who um, say they are trying to get information out about this paedophile ring in its various and indeed almost infinite forms um, should think that when people have another opinion from them or differ in certain facts and emphasis that they should be subjected to abuse on the scale that we are seeing in relation to those questioning genuine people who do accept that there is a a, a paedophile uh, network but have questioned aspects of Pizzagate that they should be subjected to um, abuse, ridicule and uh, such extraordinary levels of hostility. Because what does that do? It silences people. And what uh, does the uh, abuse and ridicule and dismissal of those uh, seeking to expose the paedophile networks, what does, what does that do? It silences them. Now, if we are going to bring to the surface uh, what is really happening to children worldwide on a staggering scale, then what we need first and of all, and primarily, bottom line, is the free flow of information, the free flow of opinion, and the free flow of um, information. Now, we are not going to have that if all that happens when anyone questions even some details of someone else's view, i.e., let's talk about, in this case, Pizzagate, that they are going to be subjected to what they are being subjected to now. Because that, what, what that means is you're, you're, you're blocking the free flow of opinion and the free flow of information by, by, by intimidating people into silence, which is exactly how we, th th this whole paedophile network globally uh, has been kept under wraps all this time. And, you know, it, this may come as a shock to some uh, uh, of, of these um, abusers uh, uh, of those questioning Pizzagate. It's actually very good when people have a different opinion. It's, it's, it's actually very good when people challenge you and question you. You know why? Because it makes you um, question your certainty. It makes you question if every last fact that you claim to be fact is actually true. And what that means is if you have the humility to think that maybe, maybe we don't know it all, maybe not every assumption we've made is necessarily true, then you can look at those assumptions again. You can recheck the facts. You can recheck where this accepted piece of information, where did the original source come from? But no, people who question Pizzagate are um, in, in detail, not even uh, necessarily in its entirety, 
uh, they are subject to this extraordinary level of hostility. And what I would say to those people um, who are issuing forth the abuse, look at what you say about the suppression of information and the suppression of opinion by the mainstream media and then find a fricking mirror and ask yourself, well, am I actually behaving in the same way that that, that I claim to oppose behaves? And the answer, if, if people are honest with themselves, over and over again will be, yes, it is. So let us not forget either, of course, that uh, trolls and abusers of people in the way that I've talked about um, also connect in to a now massive and highly sophisticated uh, military computerized system of um, systematic trolling and um, seeking to undermine those who are putting out information that um, people uh, uh, or those in the shadows don't want people to hear. But beyond that, we still have this um, very significant number of people who are not connected to the military, who, who act in the interests of the suppressors by abusing those who question anything they say. And I say that from the perspective of knowing for a long time, more than, more than 20 years now, that these elite paedophile rings in the end ring exist and that they connect into the child sacrificing uh, satanic rings. Going back as far as uh, 1998, I published this book, The Biggest Secret, which um, named people like the former Prime Minister of Britain, Edward Heath, as a paedophile and Satanist. And um, the passage in the book was read to him. He was still an MP, Member of Parliament at the time, was read to him in the week of publication. What did he do? Nothing. Why? Because it was true. And it took nearly... Uh, 20 years for um, a police investigation um, triggered by uh, other uh, sources, not mine, uh, to, to start into the um, child abuse allegations against Edward Heath. Of course, now, um, as with all aspects of this uh, child abuse, paedophilia, revelation in Britain that came out after the um, the revelations about the BBC entertainer and record-breaking paedophile Jimmy Savile. Um, the investigation of Ted Heath is um, being attacked by aspects of the media, usual suspects, um, to try to kill that as they did the same with um, uh, killing um, investigations into um, Leon Britain a uh, Margaret Thatcher cabinet minister and home secretary who I named in a later book. Um, again, while he was still alive. And in The Biggest Secret, someone else I named in uh, 1998 was a guy called Lord Alistair McAlpine. He was the Svengali spinner um, and closest of close associates throughout her period as Prime Minister of Margaret Thatcher. Um, he was uh, named to me uh, by enough people for me to take it uh, seriously and name him in the book um, during the 1990s. And um, of course, after the Savile um, revelations, there was this scandal in Britain when um, it was alleged that Lord McAlpine uh, was a paedophile. 
And he then goes around um, threatening uh, uh, libel actions and instigating one or two um, over uh, people actually in the end didn't name him directly. And he got massive payouts from the BBC and independent television, who, who neither of which named him. Go figure. And I named him in the 1990s in The Biggest Secret. And I named him again on the internet after the, the, the revelations became public all that time later. And he never even contacted me. And it's interesting that... Uh, he was the spinner of, um, and Svengali of Margaret Thatcher. The revelations about the Westminster paedophile ring were based upon um, the period of the Thatcher government. Margaret Thatcher was a very close friend of Jimmy Savile, and Jimmy Savile was an inner circle bosom buddy of the British royal family, uh, brought into that circle in the 1960s by Lord Mountbatten, member of the royal family, uh, who was a known paedophile. So when you look at um, my background, um, I, I've been at it with exposing this ring and uncovering it. For decades. But that doesn't mean that you, you can't question every uh, fact of every allegation and maybe think there's not enough to go on here to be so definite. Not that there's nothing happening. No, no. But be careful you don't make two and two equal um, 4,250, because if we do, it takes one massive exposure that allegations of paedophile, a paedophile ring or a satanic ring is provable nonsense. And um, it discredits everything else. That's why everyone involved in this has a duty to the abused children to make sure that every fact is fact is uh, checked and um, every assumption is based on um, credible um, information and credible sources. Against the background, in terms of Petergate, that without question, if you've um, stood next to me in the last 20 odd years, there is a massive elite paedophile network operating out of Washington DC and out of um, the elite of the United States. And indeed in, um, in, the, in the biggest secret, I, um, I expose um, Father George Bush as a notorious paedophile and abuser of children. Um, and uh, if you uh, go on to my um, YouTube channel, you'll see posted recently a, um, a video where I'm talking about Father George Bush and um, the, all that background. And um, the last time I looked as I speak, closing in on 350,000 people have watched that um, in a matter of three days or so. And then there's, there is another book, um, Transformation of America by Kathy O'Brien. This came out in 1995. Um, and I met Kathy O'Brien and her partner um, very soon after um, the book uh, came out. And I spent a lot of time with her um, talking about her experiences. I, 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 I met her, her daughter, uh, Kelly, who was born into captivity, literally, because uh, Kathy O'Brien um, was one of a, an extraordinary number of young people who are taking into mind control projects, which connect into the paedophile rings, connect into the satanic rings, 
um, and are turned literally into sex slaves who um, are used um, and abused by the elite and then um, can't remember what happened until they're deprogrammed like Kathy's been. Um, what happened, thus keeping the elite people safe from exposure. Uh, it's called um, trauma-based mind control, uh, creating uh, multiple personality disorder, known now as uh, dissociative identity disorder. I've talked about this and written about this at, at, at great length. And um, Kelly, um, Kathy's daughter, was born while Kathy was still in a government mind control project, um, a project known as um, uh, Project Monarch, an elite part of a mind control operation in America that actually became public called MK Ultra. And what um, Kathy uh, describes in the book from her period in captivity. Um, from a small child through into her, her 30s was the unspeakable behavior of the Clinton family, um, Clinton family, Bill Clinton and Hillary Clinton, and the Bush family in the form of Father George Bush and people like Dick Cheney and a stream of other people in that same period of the Reagan, Bush and Bush administrations. Unspeakable is, is a word that doesn't even begin to cut it. Not just uh, child abuse sexually, but torture. The sexual and uh, abuse and torture of um, of young women and others. And these, by the way, are the people that gave the order to invade countries and bomb countries. Anyone think that they will have any empathy with the people on the other end of the bombs, whether it's in Syria or Libya or Iraq? when you have so you have such a deleted empathy a capacity for empathy that you will do that to kids so what goes on behind the scenes is so fantastic so horrible so horrific that so many people, and you've got to understand that, and understand why, find it difficult, who've not done the research, who've not spoken to the people involved, and I've spoken to legions of them, um, in terms of the victims. They f find it impossible to bridge that gap between the world as they think it is and the world in the shadows, as it really is. And... There was, of course, more confirmation of this in America with the um, the revelations of a Nebraska state senator called John W. DeCamp, who wrote a, a, a book um, called uh, The Franklin Cover-Up, which um, didn't set out to uh, expose or uncover an elite paedophile ring connected to the Republican Party. It set out to investigate the corruption of something called the Franklin uh, Credit Union in Nebraska, which was headed by a guy called Lawrence King, uh, a, a, a big Republican who actually sang the national anthem at the Republican conventions in 1984 and 1988. And what DeCamp did as he was uncovering the corruption for which Lawrence King was eventually uh, uh, jailed, he found that King was running an elite paedophile ring, supplying children to elite politicians in the Republican Party at, at, at conventions and what have you. Exactly the same theme and exactly the same story that you hear around the world in terms of uh, political um, 
paedophiles in Britain and in Australia. I mean, does anyone really think that it's just a coincidence that people have come out in America, they've come out in, 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 in Britain, they've come out in, in Australia and other countries talking about this, describing the same themes, the same uh, 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 abuse, the same elite uh, networks, and it's all a coincidence and they're all just making it up. That's what the media want you to believe. And that's why I say to those investigating Pizzagate and passing on stuff about Pizzagate, just make sure that your assumptions are justified by the evidence and that things you take for granted as being true have been taken back to their original source to see if they are and to see what that source is and is it credible. You know, what can happen is something gets on the internet and it's passed around and suddenly where it actually originally came from is forgotten. It's taken for granted, it's true. And it may be. What I'm saying is take it back to where it came from, where it originated every time to see if that original source is credible and credible enough to take it for granted that it must be true. Now, there are, without question, uh, things that people should be questioning about this whole Pizzagate. This idea that there is a, um, a paedophile ring in um, Washington, D.C. There is, okay? It's not a question of is there a paedophile ring in, in, uh, in, um, in Washington, D.C. My God, there is and involves some of the most famous people in Washington. The question is, is all the detail about Pizzagate supportable? Because we've got to be careful that these things are not put out there to discredit everything else. That's why we've got to be really, really uh, um, focused and disciplined about sources and making sure that two and two that we think equals four actually equals another number. Um, but there are things about uh, Pizzagate, this idea that there are codes, for instance, um, of pizza and hot dog and, uh, and other things that connect um, to a paedophile coded language where these things appear to say one thing but are actually talking about children. Now again we need to go back to where th those uh, those codes um, came from to see if they come from a credible source and they can be taken as read. But when you read these emails that come out through WikiLeaks that on which uh, Pizzagate is based um, emails um, involving people like uh, John Podesta, um, who was the chairman of Hillary Clinton's um, election campaign or non-election campaign, and his brother Tony Podesta, a, um, a lobbyist um, in Washington. Um, some of them certainly appear to be written in code. Um, the question is, what is the code? And why? And I, I think it, it's um, it's extraordinary. Well, it's not really when you know how it works. Why the mainstream media has not gone to these people and said, "Look, these emails where you where you're talking about pizzas and hot dogs, um, or, or others writing to you are talking about it." Um, it, it, it <laughs> Why the obsession with pizzas and hot dogs? What, what, what does this actually mean? Can you just explain what, what this email was about, what we're saying? And if, if they come out with a, a credible um, explanation, well, fair enough, thank you. But if they don't, well, what's this code? Um, and, you know, it's been said that um, the Podestas um, are creepy. And John Podesta, of course, um, uh, not only has served Hillary Clinton's uh, um, 
election campaign, but was um, chief of staff to Bill Clinton when he was president and was a very close advisor to Barack Obama. So this is a, a big wig in, in, in Washington. And people have, have, have said that, um, that the pedestrians are creepy. Well, in my view, um, the pedestrians are creepy. I mean, Tony Podesta seems to have a very strange um, uh, taste in art. For instance, one of his uh, favourite um, artists, he said, is someone, a Serbian artist, who paints pictures of um, semi-clad, semi-naked children looking very traumatised and of children tied up floating dead in swimming pools. I mean, hello? Creepy, are you kidding? And that kind of reminds me of um, Lord McAlpine, who had a um, art collection of uh, an artist called Graham Ovenden, whose speciality was painting naked little children and semi-naked little children. A Graham Ovenden who eventually was jailed for paedophilia. What are these people... What are these people doing with art, alleged, like that and, and, and saying how good it is? The other thing is, of course, in this Pizzagate um, whole story and the allegations, um, is uh, an artist who um, talks about something called spirit cooking, which um, involves um, give some quotes me. involves um, cooking. Nice recipe. Mix fresh breast milk with fresh sperm milk. Drink on earthquake nights. With a sharp knife cut deeply into the middle finger of your left hand. Eat the pain. Fresh morning urine. She's taking the piss. Um, sprinkle over nightmare dreams. Etc. Um, and... She's a friend of Tony Podesta. Um, and, you know, the people um, that are making the decisions that dictate our lives um, are not like most of the population is. And we need to kind of understand that there is the world that, that, that the population lives in, and then there's the world that they live in, which is very different, to say the least. Then um, we have um, this connection to um, Jeffrey Epstein, the um, jailed paedophile, very rich man, who um, has been a close friend and associate of Bill Clinton, Bill Clinton's had uh, something like 26 um, times that he's been on uh, Epstein's plane, which is known as the Lolita Express because of its connection to paedophilia. Um, Epstein is a, uh, a friend of Hillary Clinton. He's uh, a friend of, um, or certainly uh, was, um, of people like um, Donald Trump, the president-elect, of Prince Andrew, and many others that would be called elite. And then you look um, in Britain when we're putting together all these pieces of information, which when you put them together, um, create a situation where 
these elite paedophile rings, or ring in the end, are actually in plain sight. But you, you just you need to take take these different, apparently different pieces of information and situations and put them together. And then suddenly the pixels become a picture. So let's let's go to um, Jimmy Savile, if we must. The BBC, quote, entertainer, who after his death in 2011 was exposed as a um, record-breaking paedophile. What's not come out is that he was a procurer of children for the rich and famous. And that's why he managed to be a record-breaking paedophile decade after decade after decade, while being an inner uh, circle bosom buddy of the British royal family and a close associate and friend of Margaret Thatcher, the Prime Minister, without getting caught, charged, put away with the key thrown, mid-Atlantic. That's why he got away with it. And let's just analyse this, this and how, how these rings infiltrate every aspect of society. You cannot cough out of tune near the British royal family if without the British intelligence network knowing about it. Just talk to people about the, um, uh, the background checks that go on uh, for people that are going to have anything to do with the Queen or other members of the royal family, for instance. And yet, it's known that the police knew about Jimmy Savile's activities, paedophile activities, and he was into Satanism as well, because like I say, they're connected. I did nothing. So, we're asked to believe that British intelligence one of whom's uh, jobs and special branch, uh, the basically the intelligence arm of the police, um, didn't know that this inner circle confidant of people like Prince Charles and the royal family, Prince Philip, that British intelligence did not know what Savile was up to decade after decade after decade, when the scale was stunning. Of course they bloody knew. Or we're being asked to believe that the FBI and the CIA didn't know what Father George Bush and, and Cheney and Clinton, and the, well, both Clintons, have been up to decade after decade after decade. Of course they knew. Of course they know. So why don't they do anything? Because the rings ring infiltrates all aspects of society needed to do what they do and to cover up what they do. And um, it's so sad as well as sickening to see the way the media particularly the usual suspects in the media seek to trash and discredit any of these um, various aspects whether it's in this country or that country these various um, expressions of this paedophile ring being exposed and thus being exposed with it, the true nature of those that run our world. At the moment in Britain, we have um, the papers full of um, allegations by former young footballers of being sexually abused by coaches. Uh, and the papers are full of it. 
they're outraged that this could have been done to young footballers by by football coaches. And they're right to be outraged. It's appalling. But you see, exposing football coaches for the sexual abuse of young footballers is not going to bring the system down. It doesn't threaten the system at all. It might threaten the system of football. But don't threaten the system that dictates human society and the direction that it goes. But if the truth came out of the scale of child abuse, child torture, child sacrifice, Satanism, involving some of the most famous political leaders, politicians and connected people that came out, the system would fall because people en masse would see the force that's really controlling their lives and how it has an obsession with children for reasons I explain in the books. There's a lot more background needed before that can be um, adequately explained. And so only in the last few days, we've had the um, police investigation into allegations about Edward Heath being trashed by the Mail on Sunday and the Daily Mail. Did I say usual suspects? We've had the investigations into um, the Thatcher cabinet minister, Leon Britton, being trashed by um, significant parts of the media. And of course, the government investigation, so-called inquiry, into the allegations of a Westminster paedophile ring, a la same as the Washington paedophile ring, uh, being systematically trashed. The present Prime Minister of Britain, uh, Theresa May, was Home Secretary when the pressure from the scale of revelations forced the uh, government into announcing an inquiry into this political paedophilia in Britain and other things as well relating to child abuse. And one of the people at the centre of this was Leon Britton in terms of appearing before the inquiry to answer questions, not least at how a um, dossier of elite child abuse given to him by a Conservative MP called Geoffrey Dickens suddenly disappeared and was not acted upon. And so Theresa May, either she's completely and utterly, fundamentally, shockingly idiotic and incompetent, or announces that the head of this inquiry is going to be someone called um, Baroness Butler Sloss, who just happens to be the sister of one of the people, a guy called Lord Havers, Attorney General at the time that um, Leon Britton was Home Secretary, who was connected into this whole series of paedophile allegations and what happened to the dossier. So obviously, when this is exposed, Butler's loss has to stand down. Then she announces that someone called Fiona Wolf is going to take over. Okay? Fiona Wolf just happens to be a friend of Leon Britton's wife, um, has had dinner with Leon Britton, and lived in the same street. When that is uh, revealed, she has to stand out. Then 
Theresa May goes to the other side of the world to a judge in New Zealand called Dame Lowell Goddard, who um, very quickly uh, uh, revealed uh, and actually uh, confirmed more since her resignation to be absolutely not up to the job. So there's three gone. What's happened? Time is put between the, the revelations that were kind of, or the claims that were everywhere and now. Just easing out the time, letting it go quiet, letting the public forget about it. And another thing is that with all these delays caused by what I've just described, these delays delayed the appearance of Leon Britton before the inquiry to answer questions. Leon Britton then died, it is said, of cancer. After a long illness. After a long illness. So they knew, um, if you go with the official story, that Leon Britton had cancer and was dying of cancer. If you really wanted to find out about the background to what has gone on, what would you do? You'd get him in front of um, an official body as quickly as possible to get on the record his um, replies to these allegations and questions. No. Because of the delay, he died. And we'll never hear him answer for what he um, is said to have done, not least about the dossier. So, when you... And I, I mean, I could talk for hours. I won't, but I could. When you um, put all these things together, um, like I say, it's it's in plain sight. And if you look at Pizzagate in terms of its theme, rather than the fine detail of this pizza operation or this or that or that, if you look at it only in terms of theme, then of course, when you put the dots together, it's based on something that is actually happening on a staggering scale. But I would just say to those that are focusing on this and investigating this, and good luck to them, I say, just make sure that you don't get carried away to the point that you're making assumptions on detail that can be discredited and thus by association discredit the whole idea that there's a paedophile ring at all. Go back to original sources. Check, recheck, check again. And, uh, and if then it all adds up, then well done you. Because the more people that investigate this whole arena, the better. But it's got to be investigated um, in a professional way. And not just because something's been passed to you on Facebook to accept that it's true, by definition. And I would say again, to those who issue forth this extraordinary shocking level of abuse at those that are questioning some of the detail, even all of the assumptions of Pizzagate. You're just doing what that which you are opposing wants you to do by intimidating people into silence.